Solidarity comrades, I know this is a another very quick in succession video for me, um, something I've always promised but never held to. Um, and today in this video we're going to speak on Gonzaloism, or also known as Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, Gonzalo thought, um, and also Chairman Gonzalo. And a little bit about their history in Peru. These people are better known colloquially as Sendero Luminoso, from one of their uh, from one of their uh, published statements or letters or something like that. Uh, oh yeah, they published it in that, but they got it from a quote from actually um, the founder, basically of Latin American. Um, communism and Marxism-Leninism and um, if anyone can remind me of his name I, I was so focused on Gonzalo I didn't even think about this but uh, I think it's Mario Tagui I can't pronounce it it's it's a it's a very uh, it's a it's a, it's a name that I haven't looked at recently and it's a difficult to pronounce name anyway basically a founding theorist and he he said that um, Marxism, Leninism is uh, is the shining path to revolution, or something along those lines, and that's where uh, shining path, Sinduro Luminoso, comes from. So, um, well, I think where we where we should start is who is Chairman Gonzalo? Um, well, his real name is Abidal Guzman, and he's currently under arrest in prison. Uh, by the Peruvian government um, for his actions um, throughout the Shining Paths um, war uh, against the government of Peru. But his origins come from I mean he, he was a uh, from a well-off European white bourgeois family and he was a university professor up in the um, up in a mountainous region like most of Peru but you know outside of the big city where he had a lot of influence and um, during the Sino-Soviet split um, and in around 61 he, he took the side of China and during his time you know he he was an agitator uh, within the universities and amongst the students at his university and Gonzalo um, started his own group many people claiming to be the true Peruvian Communist Party you know the Communist Party or the Communist Party of Peru they were one and to distinguish themselves um, people called them uh, Sendero Luminoso um, and in the 1980s, um, after the party, the, the Gonzaloist party was founded, uh, they started what they claim, uh, they claimed that they started a people's war, protracted people's war in, in Peru along the countryside, along the lines of what Mao Zedong did in China in the, in the 30s and 40s. And, um, sorry, this is just a bad setup. In the 30s and 40s, I'm using a pizza box. <laughs> um, um, but anyway, yeah, so they launched a people's war, and because of this people's war launching, um, and some attacks that they did, um, the right-wing autocrat Alberto Fujimori who was the president um, of um, Peru during the late 80s and early 90s he uh, instituted martial law and they sent out death squads and were massacring peasants and you know extrajudicial killings and just uh, mass arrests of indigenous peoples but that doesn't say uh, you, you know the entire story either Sendero Luminoso 
also killed peasants. They committed massacres against them. I mean, indigenous first-hand eyewitnesses. I'm not going to question the native peoples and what they've seen and who did it. And they've captured the people while they're in the act sometimes. So Sendero Luminoso, out of... <sighs> they were beginning to lose popularity because of the martial law. Because the people felt that it was their fault that the martial law was instilled. And so they tried to... They tried to, you know, exert their power over people who were resisting them and fighting for, you, you know, the government. Because they were sick of martial law. You know, they couldn't run to the government. They couldn't run to the... Uh, Senderonistas, you know, there was nowhere to run, so you either chose one or the other, and you had reprimands from both. And it was unfortunate. And I think that, and, you know, they were pretty much wiped out whenever in the mid 90s they were, uh, uh, Chairman Gonzalo and the high leadership was all caught. And today they still exist in some rem remnant, they still, you know, publish. Um, on their website, um, you know, there's a claim <laughs> in the low hundreds uh, of combatants that still exist out there, but you don't really hear about the Sendero Luminoso anymore. It's amazing because around 1991, 1992, and this is post-Soviet Union, you know, this is a whole new thing, and they nearly won. They had control of most of the countryside. And they nearly won the revolution. There were many pundits from the right, the left, the center, the imperialist corps, the socialist corps, that thought that Sendero Luminoso was going to win. And they fell apart because of their own ultra-leftism. And let's talk about that ultra-leftism a little bit. So, Maoism, Maoism. We have to go back to what Maoism is. And the first, you know, iterations of what Maoism was, was out of the Cultural Revolution and the Sino-Soviet split. You know, a distinct uh, strain of ultra-leftism within the Chinese uh, Communist Party um, had won out during the Cultural Revolution. And this sort of ideology that was there was taken by many, many... Um, Western communist, Indian communist, Filipino communist, communists across the world. And they call themselves Maoists. Now, this is a little bit different than what we call modern Maoism, Marxism-Leninism Maoism. Um, at that time, that was sort of a out of the new left. This was a new left thing. It was... It was based heavily on geopolitics and the ideology wasn't very deep. They thought of themselves really as Marxist Leninists. They just distinguished themselves as Maoists. Now in the 80s with The Shining Path Chairman Gonzalo synthesized an early iteration of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism also called uh, Gonzaloism or uh, Chairman Gonzalo Thought and basically he synthesized what he thought was a higher stage of Marxism-Leninism. It's beyond Marxism. It's beyond Leninism and Marxism-Leninism. This is Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, a synthesis for a new age, you know. And um, basically, this is ultra-leftism incarnate. They believed in the universality of the protracted people's war, which means that, that it can be applied to any country under any material conditions at any time, when the protracted people's war is not <laughs> meant for all conditions. There are maybe some conditions in the modern day that can use it, such as the Philippines, and uh, I wouldn't say India because, you know, my comrades from India and the CPIM and the CPI have, you know, have a very dialectical... Uh, reasons for not liking the perpetual war that the Naxalites have brought to a lot of peasants. But, um, maybe. I'm not speaking about authority. I'm not an authority on these issues in other countries. But the universality of the protracted people's war is, frankly, ridiculous. You're taking this... It's no longer a concrete idea. 
it's only a concrete idea when it existed in China, when it was in practical use. It's only a concrete idea in places like uh, the Philippines today with the MPA and the Naxalites and previously the Peruvians. Yes, to them, the protracted people's war was a real thing. But it was only a successful thing in one place, and that was China. Um, so we see from them trying to project this abstraction of a past time and a past material conditions, which you could never replicate, even if a second time, even if you had ever, all the conditions the same again. It's just, it's not something that can be replicated. You can't take this idea, this image, this not real tangible thing from the past and apply it. You can learn from that past thing. You can learn from the social praxis and the correct and incorrect ideas from it. But you have to create your own version of revolution in your country. You cannot take something from the past and imprint it on this day. It's going to be completely different and it's going to have its own character. Look at every single successful socialist revolution. Look at every single socialist country today. The way that they have done their revolution and manifested their socialism is unique and based on the concrete material conditions, the place that they're located in, and the time period that they're in. You cannot take the idea of the protracted people's war, which was meant for 1930s, 40s China, and apply it to somewhere like uh, Peru in the, in the 1980s. Yes, there was a large uh, peasant uh, population, but Peru is not China. Not even close. Not by population, not by culture, not by anything. It, their revolution is going to look very different. Now, this uh, that wasn't the only mistake, but they decried everyone who did not follow their ideology as revisionists and alienated themselves from the international communist movement. Um, you know, they fought communists and left-wingers and, and left-wing activists and trade unionists and peasant leaders in their own country for being revisionists. And they believed in Mao Zedong's three worlds theory and social imperialism, which isn't a real thing. Social imperialism doesn't exist. That's not how dialectics work. Imperialism is a dialectic idea. And you can't start adding these buzz, ultra, ultra, buzzword ultra-left labels to it and call it imp a, a, an imperialism of a different kind. It's either imperialist or it's not. Um, and uh, so he, he believed that the second world, the... the the socialist camps of existing socialism were more of a harm than the imperialist first world. It's just something that he believed in. And also to that effect, he would support um, any movement that was against uh, Soviet forces in places of revolution. And um, so he was isolated, he was attacking left-wingers, he was attacking peasants. And he had this idea of Marxism learning the universality of the protracted people's war, which we've already discussed can't be universal. Uh, the application of new democracy to uh, Peru, which would, I think new democracy in the 21st century makes more sense for a country like the United States that is deindustrialized and needs to build up its industrial forces again before it can have the productive forces ready for socialism. But in Peru at that time, there was no need for a new democracy. The proletariat, the, the proletariat is the main force in Peru to this day. Now, the peasantry was a very high percentage, but instilling new democracy, that is a long-term plan, literally century-long plan, which is odd for such an ultra-leftist calling everyone revisionist for doing similar things, like China, for example. So he seems to actually misunderstand what new democracy is and what it actually does. And so, I mean, the ultimate failure of Gonzalo and the Shining Path and Sendero Luminoso was this ultra-leftist stance that isolated them from any comrades and their violence against the peasantry for, not, for the peasantry not listening to what they wanted to do, not going along with it. They missed the key. They have these abstract ideas, which is the problem with the ultra-left in general. They have these abstract ideas about 
revolution and what it should look like uh, from either the past or from their own, you know, musings. And they want to see this puristic version that they have laid out in their documents to come a to arise, but that's not how socialism or revolution works. It c arises out of, the, out of the will of the masses. It is a force of history. It is concrete and it's material. And you cannot change the material and the concrete. You have to go with that flow. But you can also lead it on that flow in the right direction using the clarification of Marxism-Leninism, keeping your ear on the beating heart of the masses, and trying to interpret that in a way that you can clarify it, and maybe as a vanguard party help steer the masses. But the masses are going to be the power behind it. They are going to be the locomotives of history. They are the fuel to the fire. And you cannot force something upon the masses that they will not do. And that's where he advocated for mass line, but missed it completely. And that's, and today, um, you know, we're going to end it talking about um, modern iterations of Gonzaloism. Um, Red Guards Austin, um, they might be called something else now. Uh, groups like that. Uh, these are Gonzaloists. Um, I do not associate them with the Marxist-Leninist-Maoist comrades. Now, I disagree a lot with Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, especially a lot on their idea of what socialism and social imperialism, but these people, Marxism, Marxist-Leninist-Maoists that are a rupture from um, the Gonzaloist thought to a more dialectical approach and a more uh, serve the people approach to, to movement building. And these people are not the same as Gonzaloists. They took and saw what Chairman Gonzalo did and the ideas that came out of him and synthesized it into a much more coherent ideology that can adapt to the material conditions. And I respect um, uh, groups like uh, For the People um, Black Red Guard, comrades like that that have synthesized, uh, that, that have taken a synthesicate, synthesized version of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, more, uh, from G the Gonzaloites, but also out of the tradition of, uh, the Black Panther Party, which had its own synthesis of Maoism in the, uh, in the 60s and 70s. And so it's interesting how they take those two different strands and sort of put it into a more coherent and practical and tangible thing that you can touch. And I really like that about them, even though I'm a Marxist-Leninist. Um, but yeah, uh, modern Gonzaloites um, are usually wreckers, um, like the Red Guards would go around attacking PSL and Workers World Party and DSA. While I would never join any of those groups and have my issues, those are allies in our fight um, especially during this stage maybe not during the construction of socialism like DSA but right now we can't be we have we have to look at the primary contradiction and the other secondary contradictions that are way above this other minor contradiction uh, I think there's a degree to where left unity needs to be used tactically especially in under the current material conditions and attacking these groups that we don't agree with now isn't the right way to go now is the time to unite and keep our ear on what the masses want and try to provide that for them and the problem with the Gonzaloites now is that they just debase everyone including other Maoists and Marxist Leninist other Maoists as revisionists they still believe that they're going to have their protracted people's war here in the imperial core and it's ridiculous but um solidarity to the actual good malice comrades um and you know solidarity to all other left-wing strains you know from the good like uh, let me plug a couple channels right now because i usually don't say nice things about anarchists but i want to talk about the obnoxious anarchist he is a fantastic comrade who understands anti-imperialism who understands settler colonialism who understands structures of power and why they need to be removed and how to help people in the praxis on the streets he's a very intelligent comrade check him out the obnoxious anarchist um i also want to i also want to say look up red comrades in china it's uh it's a group of foreigners who live in china 
I've known some of the comrades in, in it for a long time and they've decided uh, to start creating some stuff and they've already released a couple videos so please check them out Red Comrades in China and um, yeah those are a couple of channels I wanted to promote also check out the People's School for Marxist Learning and Studies P S M L S on YouTube. We all, uh, it's the party of communist USA school. They're always releasing new, uh, new classes on all kinds of different subjects. So please check them out. Uh, please, if you like this, like it. Um, if you want to talk about something below, if you disagree with me, if you want to agree, say it down below. Um, subscribe, uh, share this with your friends and thank you. Solidarity comrades.